Hi, I'm Ed Amorosa from Tag Cyber, and I'm here with my friend Andrea Bonin Blanc, who is the founder and CEO of GEC Risk Advisory. Andrea, welcome. Thank you, Ed. It's Thank great to be know. here. Oh, gosh, it was easy to come, right? You're already yeah, here in New York. Yeah, a couple of subway stops That's from great. the Upper West Side. That's yeah. great. Now, I, I was joking with you before that I think you probably know as much or more about governance and ethics and compliance risk as anybody on the planet. You'll, you, I'm sure you'll be bashful about that. But let's start with you. We'll get into those topics because you're going to help us understand them. But tell us about yourself. How did you how, how did you get started? And tell us a little bit about your sure. career, and then we'll get into the topics. Sounds good. So I think everything that I do as a as a professional uh, was really predetermined as a as a kid growing up and being raised and born in Europe. So I was the daughter of a of a an American intelligence yeah. officer and a German mother, and then we moved to Spain, and I grew up in Spain under Franco, which really sort of. Uh, gave me a different lens on what it feels like to grow up in a non-democracy. Um, and then at 17, I came to New York City, and mm. I went to college here and Columbia University graduate mm -hmm. school and law school. And my PhD dissertation was about Spain's transition to democracy. So that sort of theme of democracy, governance, um, the importance of good leadership and culture was there very early on, even though I couldn't have predicted where it was going to go. Mm -hmm. Because I ended up um, practicing law for about eight years on Wall Street. Didn't really like that, so I was very lucky to get a great job in-house as a general counsel of a startup um, electric power, inter international electric power company that was part of PSENG, a much mm. bigger company. And so that job really gave me a platform to do a lot of the things that I've ended up doing, which was not only the general counsel piece, but uh, being a corporate secretary, risk manager, business ethics and compliance, corporate responsibility, all those things kind of fell under my jurisdiction in that job. So that was a wonderful place for me to sort of play and, and, and hopefully be responsible. And then I went on to uh, three other corporate jobs, one of which was at Bertelsmann, the big German media company. Sure where I founded and started their global ethics and compliance program for 100,000 people in 60 countries, 600 business units. So it was a very complex, um, very um, challenging, but very interesting job. And I had a wonderful boss at the end of that uh, period that I was with them uh, who really believed in what we were doing. And really, uh, he just provided the resources and provided um, the leadership, really, that was necessary to get this kind of daunting task done. And then I worked in a couple of more companies, and uh, about six years ago now, I started my own business doing all of the above, but in a strategic way, trying to help leaders of companies, of uh, nonprofits, even of government agencies, to understand their most important strategic risks and also see them as opportunities. So that's kind of the arc of what I've been doing for the last whatever years, I won't say how many decades. What was, what was the PhD work in? What, what did you focus on? So it was a political science PhD, and um, obviously you have to do some coursework, but then I, I chose the uh, theme of Spain's transition to democracy, oh. and I focused on the whole politics of constitution making. So. In Spain, they were one of the first countries to really go from authoritarianism to democracy yeah. uh, in the mid-70s, and then, of course, a wave of other democratic. Some countries go the other way. Well, I won't mention yeah, it. Yeah, we, we have a few of those <laughs> going on right now, but for me, hope springs eternal, and the, the better angels of our nature are the ones that rule, hopefully. So, so, I'm, um, so when I wrote that, it was one of the first examples of a really successful transition to democracy without violence and civil war and that kind of thing. And then several other countries in Latin America and Eastern Europe that all kind of, there were waves and waves of democratization. Now we're kind of reaching a, another sort of uh, touch point, which is a kind of a, a concerning one. And geopolitical risk is one of the areas that I, that I dabble in now for my clients um, and, and the writings that I do and so on. Yeah. So it's kind of all come together with some other things that I do. And you've done some teaching. Yes, uh, I've been an adjunct to faculty over at NYU for about yeah. 12 years. I've done a couple of uh, created courses for them. I'm about to talk to them about another course, potentially in cyber. No, so we'll see. Oh, well, um, I can I teach over there. I can help well, you. Well, there you go. Let's make there you sure go. we we'll, we'll collaborate. I'm happy to help you. <laughs> Sounds good. You have the most varied and interesting background. You should be the Secretary of State, I think. <laughs> Well, if I had gone in a different direction, that probably would have been one of my uh, goals, but I didn't go in that direction. Never served in government, so. Now, as I said, I think you, you kind of get the governance um, bracket as well as anybody. 
I probably shouldn't say racket, but maybe that's appropriate. It's a racket if it's not done properly. <laughs> when somebody asks you about governance in the context of a corporation or just a large yeah. organization, where do you start? Does it start with ethics? Does it start with organization? Does it start yeah. with, you know, wh wh where does all this start? I Give mean, us a I, little tutorial. Yeah, so governance to me means the board or mm. the board of directors or trustees or the oversight body yeah. that oversees an organization. It can be a, a business, it can be a nonprofit, it can even be a governmental agency. Even the intelligence agencies of our own government have oversight, and that's right. a committee of, of, of Congress. So, so there's always that role that should be fulfilled in a sort of a responsible way by, by eligible and uh, appropriately uh, high expertise people. And I yeah. think what happens in a lot of our businesses is that we have sort of a very homogenous group of people who are on boards, and I don't want to get insulting, but it's pretty much a certain age group, a certain race, and a certain gender. Mm. And that lack of diversity does not allow, and, and even more importantly, people who are mostly CEOs or CFOs. Right. So what that means is uh, those people are super smart when it comes to financial issues and yeah. operational issues, yeah. but they may not have the sensitivity to think about ESG issues and technology issues. And so, um, to me, those issues, those core categories of issues, environmental, social, governance, and technology, if they're not important parts of strategic risk management and opportunity management at the board level, you're missing a very, very important piece of the strategy of an organization, whether it's a business or something else. And so, for me, governance means having the right people at that oversight structure, who have the right kind of backgrounds and experience for that particular organization. So if you're a big technology company, if you don't have board members who are uh, retired or former or even mm. current chief information security officers, for example, or technology officers, uh, if you're an oil and gas company and you don't have someone who has some form of ESG corporate responsibility uh, in their background, you are missing a very important lens on your business and on not only the, the risk mitigation piece, which is very important, but to me, the value creation piece, because if you don't know what your risks are, you're not gonna create opportunity yeah. and you're not gonna create new value for your stakeholders. So to me, it's all part of this sort of knitted together whole, which is all about leadership and culture at the mm. end. So I could go on. No, you know, I'm gonna wanna get into risk, but I wanna start with um, the role of ethics there. Do you, do you think that that's pretty central to- uh, Absolutely central. Can you be in- yeah. um, a good governance team without having a, a proper ethical framework or do they? Or no, I mean, I, I, you know, I think uh, I've, I've had a lot of experiences both reporting to uh, CEOs and COOs and, and to boards and now as a, as a consultant, you know, helping uh, the people in my roles, my f previous roles with their boards and with their um, executive teams. And I think that the one key thing that runs through all good leadership is high integrity mm. uh, and the sense of being responsible to your stakeholders not just your shareholders if you're a business or not just your beneficiaries if you're a nonprofit you have to be sensitive to all of the different stakeholders and by having high integrity high emotional intelligence um, you will be able to serve those those constituents better and you'll also be able to create more value for them so to me ethics is at the center of mm. all of that and the word ethics is often uh, sort of mocked and, uh, you know, people you know, talk about how business ethics is an oxymoron. I disagree completely. I think it's all in the, in the sort of nomenclature that you use. I prefer the word integrity. I prefer the word, um, you know, business integrity uh, code or code of conduct. Not necessarily ethics, because ethics often gets misunderstood, especially also when you translate it into other cultures. Yeah, let me let me ask you about that, because I know it might have been in the '80s, like with the uh, uh, Michael Douglas and Wall Street. Greed is good. Also, yeah, yeah, I use that all where the time. Where <laughs> the ethical consideration became, hey, whatever helps the shareholder, I should do. Yeah. Right, yeah. and if it means laying off people doing things that may be inconsistent with the community, yep. you know, firing people or doing whatever. Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm doing the right. And, and that became the ethical guidepost, making money. Has that changed? I, I, you know, well, I don't I always... consider that an ethical guidepost. I consider that a goal and objective. Mm. And I think that businesses especially that are simply looking at their financial uh, sort of equations, uh, revenues, profits, right. whatever, uh, stock price, 
um, they're really kind of horses with blinders. They're not seeing uh, yeah. the sort of the situational awareness that they should see um, of what stakeholder needs what. Nowadays with social media and the age of hyper transparency, you've got people who can tweet in a, a matter of seconds uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly about you. Um, it could be facts, it can be fiction, You're it can right. be fake news. And if you have those kinds of people suddenly, uh, you know, tweeting about something you did or didn't do, or maybe, you know, it's fake news, uh, you need to be prepared for that. And I think that um, not having that sort of core message of transparency uh, from, from the leadership of a company and being prepared to deal with that mm. kind of thing is a very uh, serious challenge for today's leaders, I think. What do you see as the role of risk um, kind of in that overall equation now? And maybe even with a little um, push towards cyber, because you know that's that's our area sure. here. But um, maybe start with risk and then tell me what you think about cyber. Well, you know, I think every organization needs its version of some, some version of risk management. Yeah. And I've worked in startups and I've worked in Fortune 250 companies. And then I have clients that are even Fortune 10. So. Mm. Um, Everybody, every organization needs to create its own version of a sort of customized enterprise risk management. Obviously not all the bells and whistles if you're small or you're in early stages, but you need to have some risk management. So that means having somebody sensitive to that issue it doesn't have to be a risk officer. Yeah. It can be a CFO who's uh, savvy to these issues. It can be a CEO. Um, put, to, put the lens on that and start building that because as you become aware of what your issues are and what your risks are, you can then build the, the mitigating policies or you know, training or whatever it is that you need. But you can also start seeing where um, the downside can lead to an upside in terms of value creation. Um, and using the cyber example, actually, mm -hmm. um, a, couple, a few years ago, I did a, a major research report for the conference board called Emerging uh, Practices in Cyber Risk Management, mm -hmm. uh, Cyber Risk Governance. And it was all about looking at the board and the executive team and seeing what, where the best practices were and also some, some of the bad practices. Right. And among the best practices, we had five leading companies and we didn't name names because we wanted to protect the, the innocent actually because they were doing a really good job internally for mm. cyber risk management. And there was a Fortune 50 technology company that we looked at and their best practices included um, not only having enterprise risk management aligned with the Chief Information Security Office and the Chief Technology Office, but those three individuals also met with the CEO of the business. This is a really big business. Hmm. On a monthly basis, wow. they reported into the board on a quarterly basis. They put the board through scenario planning on cyber issues. That sounds good. And, and they were able to not only demonstrate their own per, you know, internal resilience on these issues, but they were creating products for the marketplace. Mm. And so the legitimacy and the credibility that comes with having that internal resilience and, and you know, really doing the right things internally as, a, as an organization then reflects out into the stakeholders and the cu customers and the employees. Everybody knows that it's coming from a place of credibility. So they created value by creating new products in the cyberspace because of that. Wow. You know, these um, CEOs and CFOs that you point to as being on boards, and you're right, mm -hmm. boards look for CEOs, former yeah, CEOs. Yeah, exactly. Um, they understand risk, but do they understand technology and cyber risk typically? I, I get if you, if you get a CEO who ran a, um, a tech company, right. you're going to get that. But in general, do you see the, uh, the level of understanding of technology and cybersecurity to be maybe a little bit... Um, it's, it's a little off in most off. companies. I think the companies that get it are the companies in the technology yeah. space. So they have the, the, you know, the former or current CIO. The CEO probably gets it, the management right. team they gets it. Right, they get it, so they know they need to have yeah. it on their board. Yeah. So I'm not too worried about those companies. I'm worried about all the other companies that are in more traditional businesses. Yeah. Banks. Banks. Um, banks actually get it a little more than, yeah. than say, manufacturing and retail. And, mm. and I think... What's going to bring that kind of expertise up into those boards is the fact that everything is becoming digital and they can't mm -hmm. ignore it. So to me, cyber is the other side of the coin of digital transformation. Uh, you know, cyber risk and, and security is one side of the equation, but the other side of the equation is this whole value and opportunity piece. And I think with digital transformation, uh, even though sometimes it can be very destructive because it means laying people off and closing down old businesses and yeah. things like that. I think that 
the boards of the more traditional companies will start getting that they need to have that other kind of expertise coming yeah. in. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a slow process. I think it's going there. It has to go there by necessity, I think. I think companies that do it sooner rather than later are potentially in a much better place for competitive advantage in their own sectors and so on. Um, so it shouldn't just be at the executive team level. It really has to start uh, happening at the board level as well. well. When you find an organization that has maybe a, a lesser understanding of cyber risk, do you, do you often find a um, misunderstanding of the role of compliance and security in kind of their respective roles? Is that one of the first casualties? Um, yeah, that could be. I mean, I think people don't have well-defined uh, senses often of what compliance means or what mm. security means. Yeah. Um, sometimes they lump it together. Well, most managers get compliance. A list of stuff I have yeah. to do. Yeah. If I do it, I get the certification. I'm good. Yeah. And they don't often get that. That doesn't mean you're secure. No, no. I always think that's what they get, they get wrong the most. That I compliance agree with you. thing because it's a piece of paper. Yeah, compliance is a check the box approach yeah. to things, and I think that what's missing very often is sort of that culture that comes from the top. Right. Um, I'll mention an example. Uh, one of the companies I worked for was a technology company where I was in charge of compliance, audit, and risk. Mm -hmm. And it's a within, big job. Uh, it's a big job, and it was a it was a it was a growing mid-sized company, so they couldn't afford to have people in every mm -hmm. you know uh, that many people. But it, it made sense at the time. And within a few months of starting there, they also threw information security under my. Mm -hmm. uh, under my jurisdiction. It was very painful for me, but a very useful exercise to sort of understand what the CISO was telling me and sort of get, mm -hmm. start translating what it means to a business person that's not a technologist or an engineer. So that whole ex exercise to me was really um, valuable in sort of giving me the insights that, that I have now, which means that all of us have to go through an exercise like that to understand what's really going on. And the result of that particular exercise, which was about six months of hardcore sort of understanding what was going on was, mm. oh, we can't keep doing things this way where on the one hand, the chief technology officer is like putting a patch in here and a patch in there. We need to have a philosophy of what information security looks like in our yeah, company, specifically yeah. our company. So a customized, and so my big recommendation that came out of that exercise was to say, we need a CEO level committee of key operational people, key experts that come together and decide what is the operational culture for information security for this company and how are we going to do it. And we did that. And I think that was like a really aha moment kind of a thing for me, which I've carried into work that I've done since then, which is you got to get the CEO and the executive team on the same page about these things. So it's a culture issue, not a compliance issue. You know, so it ends up being something that people do because they're incentivized to do it that way, because the CEO and the executive team are um, encouraging people to work outside of their silos and collaborate, uh, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. You know, when I ask people about um, governance trends, mm -hmm. like it's kind of looking into the future, right. I always get back a couple of different answers, and I'm really interested to hear what you have to say about trends and governance, but some will point to some of the um, younger Silicon Valley executives and maybe some poor judgment that's that's been exhibited by some of the better known companies. Mm -hmm. And others will complement that by saying, well, no, um, if you look at governance teams, maybe pointing to actuarial tables saying, mm -hmm. you know, as some of the older, you know, members who didn't grow up around technology right. and right. computing, it's not their fault, they didn't grow up with computers, right. they're Absolutely. not going to have instincts, yeah, yeah. as they replace with people who are earlier in their career, mm -hmm. who come in and have worked with a CIO, that it's getting better. Right. What do you think? Do you think governance, or maybe it's both, I don't yeah. know, where, where do you see the trends headed in, in corporate governance? Again, with this yeah. bent toward yeah. tech and, and cyber. Yeah, you know, I, I actually think there's going to be a really good, happy medium that will happen mm. uh, eventually. That's good where, to hear. Yeah, be, well, I, I'm kind of one of those hope springs eternal people, even though I'm a realist, but, but the point is, um, you know, there's a lot of very, talented young people coming out of the schools who really know the coding and they know the engineering and they know the science. Um, at the same time, I think there's a, a sort of a clarion call 
coming from various different corners that say that we still need those people who have the liberal arts background, who have sort of the broader mm -hmm. sort of um, the histo history, literature, that, that think in concepts and think in, in connecting the dots. And I think we need both kinds of people working together, uh, both at the early stages in a career, um, inventing the products and, and uh, you know, embedding ethics into artificial intelligence, for example, or embedding ethics into some other kinds of new technology so that the decisions that are made early on are actually good ones for the organization, for the, for the product mm -hmm. or, or the, the service that's being created. But I also think that that has to happen at other levels. And so I think the companies that are gonna be most successful and businesses uh, and boards are gonna have that mix of people who bring in those different lenses because we're in a world that is so hyper complex at this point that if we don't have the benefit of people like you, like me, like the younger people who are coming in who have like, who've been born into technology, um, the people who have the financial savvy, they all have to, it's like a, it's like a 360 of lenses coming in and, and you'll have the, the sort of ability then to create the, the uh, responsible products and services um, that won't destroy the world and all these other things. So I think it's really important that we start thinking about this multi-lens uh, approach to our new technology issues, and I think everybody has something to contribute. I like the multi-lens thing, but let me ask you a question. Maybe it would be a little provocative. I don't think you could be a board member, for example, without at least having some understanding of corporate finance, for Absolutely. example, or yeah. of personnel or Absolutely. marketing. Absolutely, yes. You, you I become agree. a board member, and I have been, or mm -hmm. a large bank, so mm -hmm. I, I, I know that when you come in, there's a, a pre presumption that you have judgment because you've been Absolutely. doing it for a while. Yeah. That's why you don't join a board at 25. You no, know? and I, I agree with that. Yeah. And I, yeah. I, I think you know, there are talented, um, younger business people who have done a lot. So you could have a 40-year-old come into a board with a lot of business savvy. Certainly, right? certainly. Um, so I'm not say, advocating that 20-year-olds should be on boards. I'm advocating that people of multiple lenses no, of and, and I'm, expertise. I'm with you there. Yeah. But I wanted to ask you, do you think we're at the point now where maybe it's a little bit of table stakes that if you're going to be a board member, you have at least some working understanding of tech? Or is it possible to have none? I mean, I th I, I've I been at meetings should. where there's board members who can't turn on an iPad. Yeah, and, I, we'll ju and there's no social consequence to that. Yeah. Whereas if you go to a meeting and you say, what's an income statement? There'd be some muttering over coffee at break, right? I totally agree but with tech, you. But tech, you can yeah. get away with being a complete luddite. How do we fix that? Um, I think maybe we the fix actuarial it through tables. term limits and uh, rotating yeah. people off of boards. I, I think mean, that's what'll happen. And, and I think that's part of the diversity uh, sort of discussion that we have to have at the board level. It's not just about men and women. It's not just about yeah. different races and geographical backgrounds. It's about age. And it's about uh, expertise. The tech, right? I tech, mean, yeah. I, I, anybody right now who's in the first, say, third of their career is so immersed in technology. It's the way they communicate. Yeah. yeah. It's the way they, it might be the product of their work. Right. It may be the way they socialize mm -hmm. at work. Yeah. Whereas you and I at one point probably would go through a whole work day without really even touching a piece of technology. You might have pad and paper the whole day, yeah. going to meetings and talking. Who does that now? There's no such thing. No, no. So I think that element of the workforce needs to be better represented totally in the board. And they're not now. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and it's a, it's a catch-22 because, as, as you said, you used the example, you could be about 40 and coming in. That's probably about when you start. But yeah. I, I don't think the judgment, the broad judgment is there um, earlier in the career. No, you, I agree with you. I totally agree with you. There's something like a Theranos. You well, look you know, at their CEO. Exactly. Brilliant young woman. Well, not that no. brilliant. She was well, a good grifter. Brilliant in the, um, <laughs> I like to, in the sales. The technical sense, maybe. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. But, but, but the judgment comes later. I agree. You know, there's a, something I read a while back, and I kind of use it to make myself feel better. But um, that as the brain gets older, it doesn't necessarily get worse. It gets more, um, we're able to see the gestalt of things yes. much better. And so we may not remember all the details, but yeah. we can see the big picture and maybe drill down into Isn't some of the details. Isn't that so funny? Yeah. Like you're all eating dinner and you make fun of grandpa yeah. because grandpa can't remember what we watched a minute ago. But when there's a decision that has to be made that's big, 
you better ask grandpa. He's got the judgment. Grandpa and or grandma. Or They're grandma. gonna say, exactly. hey, this is the right yeah. thing. And they may not have remembered what they did two no. seconds ago. And I totally agree with you. It really does happen. The, the other thing I wanted to mention as a practical tip that I think is very, could be very useful to, to boards and to businesses generally, especially as the digital transformation technology continues to, to really accelerate change, is the idea of putting younger, uh, more uh, sort of technologically immersed yeah. people on a board of advisors yeah, to I'm the board or that. committee because Great um, idea. have them sort of help the the older members really, to be very frank, um, see some of those things. And of course, the other thing, besides having a younger group of people maybe as a committee to the board, an outside committee to the board, is bringing in experts who can explain things in a really useful way to the particular board for their particular business. Yeah. Now I want to close by asking about your book. You've got something new oh, coming yes. out. Tell us about the, the title, the topic. We'll pop up the cover and when, when people can expect to see Thank it. Thank you so much for asking. Um, so my latest book is the culmination of my life's work. So for better or for worse, it is what it is. It's called Gloom to Boom, mm. How Leaders Transform Risk into Resilience and Value. Well, that's a nice title. It tries to capture the sort of vision of the book, which is basically taking leaders and saying, um, you need to be equipped with a very good understanding of the general trends uh, that are taking place geopolitically and otherwise in the world. So there's a chapter on that. Then there's a chapter about leadership, ethics, and culture. And then I take them on this journey from gloom to boom, looking at four categories of risk and opportunity, environmental, social, governance, and technology. Mm. And then at the end, I have some uh, models of how you build organizational resilience and where your company might fit on a spectrum of less resilient and less ethical to much more resilient good. and transformative. And so the book is coming out um, probably in the range between May and, uh, May summer, and August. Spring, I'm summer. I'm still working on- Spring, on, summer 2019. Yeah, spring, good. summer 2019. And it's being published by Routledge, a big British publisher. Mm. And I'm really excited about it, uh, for better or for worse. Am I gonna get a signed copy? Of course you will. Oh my gosh, I better. Of I'm course. looking forward to reading that. Thank so. you. Well, thank you for uh, taking the subway over, or oh, maybe did an Uber or something. No, thanks for coming to visit <laughs> thank us. Thank you for having so, me. It was very gracious And we, of you. we all learned quite a bit listening to you. You had such great. a great um, background and, and your advisory, the work that you do uh, with clients. You know, I hope people reach out to you and, thank you. and put you to work for them. Well, I'll try to do my best. <laughs> thanks so much thank for coming you, by. Great. And we will see you next time. Mm -hmm.